little keystone. We miss you guys all so much, and um, we miss worshiping with you, and we miss seeing your faces and hugging you. And so uh, we wanted to get together and just do something um, probably for ourselves, <laughs> but we also wanted to come together and just have a worship time because that's what we're really missing right now. And on this Good Friday, we're super thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus gave, the sacrifice that we get to tell the world about right now because we have a world who is really needing hope right now. And that's what we get to share because that's the message we hold. So uh, Bobby and Mandy and I and our mom wanted to get together and we've talked about doing this for a while, but we were like, man, now's the time because um, because we, we kind of need it for our souls, <laughs> and we're hoping that it will be an encouragement to you. We don't want to be up here and thinking everybody wants to hear us, because I don't think that's the case, but um, when we were growing up, a lot of our, our the thing that we did, which is probably kind of weird looking back at it, but we used to get around the, fam about, around the piano at our house, and as a family, we would come together, and we would just sing old songs that we had grown up listening to that our grandparents sang, and um, all the old churches in Arkansas, um, the songs that we grew up listening to, they are Southern gospel songs. And um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of what we did for fun. Every once in a while, one of us would be at the piano and we'd say, hey, everybody come in here and let's just sing some songs. And um, so that's kind of what we want to do today. It's a little bit different because it's a little more spaced out than we would typically be. A lot of times whenever we would do this growing up, mom would sit at the piano and we would all be gathered around behind her and kind of around her. And, um, and we would just come together and sing. And sometimes we would sing in the car. <laughs> as, as I talk about it, it sounds real silly. <laughs> but this is what we like to do. And it was a really, it was one of my favorite things in the world um, because I feel like we, we all love music. So if you know these old songs, please feel free to sing with us from where you are because um, that's what we want. We want this to be a time of um, hopefully refreshment for you as we are going to sing some songs about uh, Christ's crucifixion, some songs about just hope and joy, and, um, and we hope that it is something that you will join in with us and sing with us. If you know the songs, maybe this will be the first time you've ever heard them, but the first one we're going to sing is um, talking about how we've never been this homesick for heaven before.
I was first born in a church, my dad was pastoring a church at the time that was in the very backy backy woods of Arkansas. And um, it, was, it was an old church called Pleasant Valley. And my mom and her parents and her brother and kind of whoever else wanted to jump up and sing the song with them would sing that song. Um, and that old church with a pot belly stove. So that one goes a long ways back and has a lot of good memories attached to it. Um, some of the other songs that we learned growing up, we actually competed with our cousins and um, the, all the music thing was a whole family affair. <laughs> so one of the songs that we sang um, for a competition was He Grew the Tree. Um, and, and so this one goes back a long ways back too, but the message holds true and the message is so perfect for Friday because of the fact that Christ knew exactly what he was doing. When he came to this earth, when he, when he was creating the earth, he knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew exactly what would happen, but he saw us as worth it. And he still grew the tree that he knew would be used to crucify him.
I think about, man, the plan that God had for us and how humbling that is that in spite of how nasty and how ugly and sinful the world is, he sent his son to die for that, meaning that no matter what I did, no matter what you did, no matter what any of us did, he was willing to do that. That's who. It's a, it's a crazy thing to think about, and that's what we celebrate on this Good Friday. I was talking with Paxton, and I was telling him that, or Nate and I were explaining that uh, this was going to be Good Friday coming up this week, and, and we were talking about how the name of that doesn't make sense because it seems like it should be Sad Friday. <laughs> seems like such a selfish name to give a day that was so sad, but, um, but the truth of the matter is is that without that cross, without that love, without that sacrifice, um, our life today is much different. So thank God for that. Um, and the next song I think we're going to do is called The Middleman. This one was my favorite song as a child growing up. This is the one I always wanted to sing because I love the message of this song. Um, and again, it's an old one. But the message of the cross, that man in the middle, we know that Jesus was crucified between two different thieves. And he was hung there as a criminal to die for my sins. I would say that one definitely was my favorite middle man. Yeah. I'm the oddball. <laughs> What'd you say? I said I'm the oddball. That's okay. <laughs> They're both good songs. Mom, what was your favorite song? The middle man. The middle man. It's a good song. 
Okay, so I think let's one of my favorite things was because we used to sing that with our cousins and stuff growing up too, and yeah. so just the memories of all of that and our the family being together and the song and yes, yeah, so I yeah. Loved growing it. up, we were um, we were very close with our cousins and we did um, like vacations together and like I said, we competed with music together and um, yeah. So there's a lot of really good memories wrapped up in that night. You know, like when we sing these songs, it makes me think of our grandparents and um, yeah, man, so many good memories. Um, how about let's do next we'll do he looked beyond my fault and saw my need and this is another favorite i love i love southern gospel music actually if that might be something maybe not everybody knows about me but the older the song to me the better i love it <laughs> and um again this one is so beautiful because it talks about how amazing grace will always be my anthem because again without his grace i'm nothing and you guys there's so much sadness going on in the to know this this anthem of hope, this anthem of grace. Because right now, I told I told um, Bobby and Mandy and Mom when we got together, I wanted to, um, I enjoy doing these things. And I've talked to others about it. Um, these things that are so much bigger than us, singing these songs and the message behind them is so much bigger than us. And it's so much bigger than the things, all the sadness that we see in the world right now. So this song to me has a great meaning behind it because of the fact that, again, without his grace, I'm nothing. So amazing grace will always be my song of praise. This song is called He Looked Beyond My Fault. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise for it. My goal is just to take a few very short minutes just to share uh, a devotional thought with you on this Good Friday. 
Before I do that, though, I would like to say a special thank you to Pam, uh, to Bobby, to Mandy, to Jenna, uh, to Elena Gildroy, to Autumn Gildroy, to Nick Shirley, to all of the people uh, that have been involved in this and have put this together to make it possible. Uh, I count those people uh, extremely valuable at a time like this. They have pulled through and done some incredible things um, up to even this moment and this event that they have put on. And uh, I, I want to let you know the girls had this idea as kind of a, um, even though Jenna had the idea for a long time, this was kind of put together as a last minute plan. And the reason that I tell you that is because I want to let you know that what you're hearing and what you will hear um, are not polished moments, but are actual natural talent moments that just blow my mind every time that I see them. And uh, people like myself who are not musicians are jealous, but we also very, very much appreciate the gifts of their talents and how they share them. And so thank you guys for sharing the stories. Thank you guys for being personal. And thank you for doing this uh, to help encourage and help people in this time. I think that is a really, really important thing. Uh, when they tell the stories of that sort of a setting being normal for them, it's, it's not a lie. I can, I can vouch for this. I can remember many times Jen and I, when we were engaged uh, in, in, or dating in college, and uh, we would drive up from Nashville to uh, Cranberry Township and uh, spend the weekend with her family. And uh, in spending that weekend, uh, there were countless times where they would gather around that baby grand piano in their living room and then just be, begin singing like that. Uh, while I sat on the recliner all by myself for hours, unable to contribute anything or do anything. Uh, and it was neat to be able to experience it, and I very much do appreciate it. And so uh, uh, I, I had nothing to offer. So um, this is a very, very interesting time. It's Good Friday today. Uh, the irony in that is on many levels, is it not? Uh, we were talking the other day uh, about the the idea of that irony, and, and it's, it's strange that on this Friday in this time of quarantine, and, and one of the, the strangest and uh, most disheartening and, and most discouraging times that, that I can ever remember, and many of you can remember in your lifetime, that we refer to this as a good Friday. Uh, but the irony goes even deeper than that because it has existed for all of time that we have referred to it as Good Friday because the irony is that it's this day that we recognize uh, the death of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our King of Kings, that died for our sins. And it is this day that ironically we call Good Friday. The implications of that are obvious for some of us, but I want to take a few minutes just to kind of go over that because I think that it speaks to a question that many people are asking right now, and it's a good question to ask. And, and I, I want you to know that uh, here at Keystone Church, we don't fear questions. Uh, we believe that we should be asking questions, and we aren't afraid of people understanding things in the Bible because we believe the Bible gives the answers that are needed. And especially right now, I, I want to encourage you to lean into the idea of what the Bible has for you because what you can find in there is more of a help in this time than anything else offers to us at all. The number one question that I feel that many people are asking right now as we hear daily now in this, this peak time uh, of this coronavirus and as we we see these things unfold and we watch the press conferences and we hear the news or read the news or whatever it may be the number one question that that people seem to be asking right now is uh, let, let's be honest if we're if we're deep down digging into our souls we want to scream out where's God in all of this where is God? If God can stop this, if he is all-powerful, if he is good, then where is he in all of this? I hope you realize that as a pastor, I think that is a very, very fair question. I think it's okay to ask that, and I think it's okay to consider that. And so we'll look at that tonight in just a, a few verses here. And I want to show you where God is in this situation. 
Because most of the time what we do is we define whether or not God is good based off of the idea of what we think good is. But if we take the actual definition of what good is, and the Bible tells us that God is good, not that that he does good things, but that all things that are good come from God, then we understand that, that our definition can't be molded in a way that it fits around God, but rather we have to understand good through the idea of God. For me personally, everything that I read in the Bible, my goal and my purpose is to submit my ideas, my thoughts, my concerns, all of that to God's Word. And in the years that I have done that and the countless times that I have read through God's Word, I have not struggled uh, to an extent that it has left me without facts and without uh, the feelings even and without emotions in some way that back up the idea that God's Word is true. And the Bible tells us where God is in all of this. What is God's perspective? With all these people dying, with all of this sickness going on right now, what is God's perspective? I think we get a glimpse of that in the story of Lazarus, his friend, his very close friend that the Bible tells us he, he died and Jesus goes to the funeral and then he watches as the mourners are gathered around in that funeral service and, and they're all devastated by what has just happened and, and everybody's doing exactly what we do when we approach God in these situations. They're looking at him saying, God, if you would, Jesus, if you would have been here sooner, this wouldn't have happened. You could have stopped this, so why haven't you? And the Bible says something very clear and small. In fact, so small it's known as the shortest verse in the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus at that moment wept. And I think that's significant because it gives us the picture of what God's perspective is. What does God think of the numbers that come out every single day of these people that are dying? What does God think of of the the tragedy and the trauma and the, the terrible things that are going on in this world? It breaks his heart. In fact, I would venture to say it breaks his heart more than it breaks ours. In fact, we know that God has absolutely done something about it. He may not have stopped coronavirus in its tracks quite yet. He may be getting ready to do that or there may not be that on the back end. But we do understand one thing. God is not and has not sat idly by. What is the biggest fear that we have? The biggest fear that we have is death. And the Bible's very certain and very clear that what we celebrate here on Good Friday is this idea of God's death. His death that is a substitution for us. See, because he hated coronavirus, sickness, sin, and evil so bad, because he despised it so much, he chose to give his life for us so that we can be saved from the plagues, the sickness, the evil, all those things. Why would he do that? That's the big question, right? Why in the world would God do that? Why would Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, step down from his throne, come and live among us, leave paradise to come to the pandemic-ridden, stricken places of the earth and live among us and experience what we've experienced? Why would he do that? I want to give you three reasons why he did that. First of all, he did it because you couldn't do it. You may say, well, I'm here. Well, yeah, but but the price of overcoming sin, according to the Bible, is perfection. And the Bible teaches us that every single person has sinned. There is no one exempt from the effects of sin, but not only that, there is no one exempt from the penalty of sin. You've messed up whether it's a small lie or a great crime, it's the same. We've all become lawbreakers that have despised and rejected God's commands and chosen to choose to define right and wrong for ourselves. We are of Adam's race, as the Bible teaches us, and therefore have inherited that problem and therefore have inherited that sentencing as well. And since we didn't have perfection... God did have perfection. The reason he's the great hero of the Bible and none of us can make it is because unlike us, he lived yet without sin. He lived a perfect life. In 1 Peter 3.18, here's what it says. For Christ also suffered once for sins. 
the righteous or the perfect for the unrighteous or the unperfect or imperfect. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Not only did he do it because we couldn't, but the Bible is also very clear that he did it because he loves us. The famous verse in John 3.16 that most everybody is familiar with is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But then it goes on in verse 17 and it says something even more clear that I want to make sure that you get as well. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. See, God loves you. The perspective of the Bible is that God loves you. How much does he love you? Well, he loves you so much that he laid down his life for you in hopes that you would get the message that he loves you. It was the, the, the note that was passed that could not be ignored. It was the, the, the proposal that you can't deny. It was loud and it was at the top of his lungs and it was obvious and it was everything that it needed to be and it was for the purpose and the hopes of catching your eye and your attention because he loves you. So now when we look around in the destruction that we live in and we say, how could this be going on? We have to look back to the cross and be reminded he loves us and he's proved it. So obviously this is not happening because he doesn't love us. See, God loved the world so much that he was willing to send his only son to die in our place. But you know what a lot of people say when we're talking about these types of things? We can say that I can love someone, but I don't have to like them. Do you have someone in your life that you're thinking of right now that, that fits that bill, right? I, I, I love them because that's what I have to do, and so I'm going to say that, but I don't necessarily like them. Not only did Jesus die on the cross because you couldn't die for yourself, not only did Jesus die on the cross because he loves you, but I also want you to understand that he did it because he likes you. <laughs> he doesn't just love you without liking you, but he likes you. Jesus tells us specifically in John 14, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The story of the Bible is very, very clear. God created perfection. It was exactly the way that it should be. And the story is told of man and woman and God walking together in community and a relationship, hanging out, spending time together in a perfect world. Man chose to define good and evil for themselves rather than to listen to God. And they were expelled from God's presence because of that rebellion. But that wasn't the end of the story. See, the, the rest of the Bible, and that's only to Genesis 3, and the entire rest of the Bible is the story of God's relentless pursuit of us. Sending Jesus to die in our place so that we could be with him. Not just loving us from afar, but desperately working to get back to us and to bridge that gap. Making it possible for us to exist together in a perfect place called heaven because of what Jesus did for us. So Good Friday, maybe not speaking to the situation that we look around and we see ourselves in. Locked in our homes, watching things on the internet the best that we can. Trying to stay sane and, and exist in the communities and the families that we're a part of. Wondering when it's going to end. Wondering if the future is good. Wondering if the security is going to happen. All those things. But good. Good in the sense that Jesus died for us. This is the day that we remember that it was his body that was broken for us, that it was the bruises that he experienced were to heal us. 
So if you're feeling like this isn't a good Friday, I want to encourage you with the word of God. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you in your place. And he wants you to have a relationship with him. How do you do that? The Bible tells us that we place our faith and our trust in him. It is by faith that we're saved. It's a gift of God. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So have you ever committed your life to Christ? Have you ever chosen to follow him and surrendered to his will, his way, making him the Lord of your life? I want to challenge you to do that tonight. Can I pray for you before we get back to more singing? God, thank you so much for this good day. And I know we've got to go back really, really far to find the good in it. And even when we go back really, really far in the timeline and we find that moment that it's defined by of you dying on that cross, it doesn't look good. But God, it was for our good. So thank you for saving us. If there's someone watching this right now that has never surrendered their life to you, God, I pray that you show them how that can be done right now. As they pray and admit that they are a sinner, and they say that they believe that you have died on the cross, but as we will celebrate on Sunday, you also rose from the dead. And as they surrender their hearts and their lives to you, God, I pray that you save them. And if they need any help, give them the courage to reach out, God, because we want to do all that we can to help them. We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. The next song we're going to sing is one that we sang hundreds of thousands of times because um, as little girls, whenever before we moved to Cranberry, when we initially moved to Pennsylvania um, and, and helped start a church in Cranberry, we had to travel around when we were really little. Um, I think I was nine. Maybe it would have been, what, four? Five? Bobby, you would have been 11-ish. So we were all really little girls, and um, as we were going around to these churches raising money, we sang the song over and over and over again. So I feel like it's very fitting for this time that we're going through right now. It says, I know the master of the wind, um, and the same God who controlled the wind back in the days of the Bible that we read is still the same God today.
last song that we're going to sing for you is one that we, again, feel is so fitting for the time. And it talks about um, how the sun's going to come up every single morning. Um, this time will not last forever. That's the hope that we have. Um, and so I hope that you can make this song um, your prayer and make it an encouragement to your soul that this, this darkness will not end forever. have joined us for this time of worship and um we love you guys and we look forward to seeing you soon keep your heads up be encouraged um the resurrection is coming so we love you guys <laughs>